play with it and change the number of sums. Yes, I am. Well, okay. Um, I'd like to get started. <clears throat> so, um, last time, if you recall, we talked about how one might go about detecting objects in photographs if you can make the assumption that the objects that you're looking for are nicely represented in terms of rectangular patches of pixels in the image. So, as you can probably guess, today we're going to talk about what to do when that's not true. So last time, we, I gave you kind of a general recipe for computational steps you have to follow or design choices that you have to make if you are going to detect things like faces or cars or irons or uh, telephones in images. And the reason why you can follow that recipe of steps is because you're assuming that pretty much every pixel inside one of those rectangular boxes corresponds to the object you're interested in. And very few of those pixels correspond to the background. But then I told you, well, OK, so there's a big set of, of objects for which you can't really do this, where any rectangle that covers up the object of interest includes a lot of pixels from the background, which makes detecting the object really hard, because if you represent the appearance of the entire patch of pixels, you're representing the appearance of not only the object, but the background, too. And you should be able to detect objects regardless of what the background is. So, this is a problem. So for these kinds of objects, the, a good representation for them is probably not one rectangular patch of pixels. <coughs> so we're going to talk about what to do. Um, now, here's kind of the big idea, which we are then going to uh, shoehorn into some mathematics. Okay? The big idea is that there is a, a set of objects in this world that are made up of clearly defined parts. And every instance, OK, almost every instance of those objects are made up of the same set of identifiable parts. Faces are one. So within reason, pretty much every face is made up of some set of parts, including two eyes, a nose, one mouth. Not two mouths, not three eyes, but one mouth and two eyes. Furthermore, <clears throat> each of those parts often has a fairly distinctive appearance. It's not the case that uh, the eye looks like the nose. If you just isolated what the part of the image that has the eye in it, you probably wouldn't say, well, maybe that's a mouth, maybe that's a nose, or maybe, I'm not sure. The eyes look like eyes, and the noses look like noses. And not only that, but there is a conspicuous spatial arrangement to those parts in any instance of this object that you take a photograph of. What I mean by that is that you are almost never, unless Halloween is coming up, but that aside, you're probably almost never going to take a photograph of someone's face where there's one eye here and one eye here, and the mouth is in the middle of the forehead, and the two ears are on the chin and on the forehead and so on. It's almost always going to be the case that there's going to be a line that's got the two eyes on it, and underneath that line is going to be the nose and the mouth. Okay, now the orientation of that line is not always fixed. You can take a photograph of somebody whose face is tilted to one side. But it's still the case that if the nose is on one side of that line, the mouth is on the same side of that line as well. So that's what I mean by having a distinctive spatial arrangement that these parts tend to appear in. So the thing we're going to do today is talk about detecting objects by following two criteria. First. You want to say that an object is present in an image if the parts are there. In other words, if there are, part, if there are sections of the image that look like your individual parts, eyes, nose, mouth, ears. And, and also, if they are in what's called a plausible arrangement. And plausible arrangement means what I just said, that the eyes, nose, and mouth are in a configuration that gives you the suggestion that it's actually a face and not just some random scrambling of uh, eyes, nose, and mouth in some random order. One other thing to consider is that, um, again, Halloween is coming up. 
And you're probably going to see, well, you might see at least one individual who's dressed up as a pirate with an eye patch. Okay, you can't actually see the eye, but you can tell that that is a face. And you know that it's a person even though you can't see all of the parts. So if you're going to represent an object, for example, the face, in terms of the appearance of the two eyes, the nose, the mouth, and the two ears, then really, if you only see one of the eyes and you see all the other stuff and it's in all the right spatial configurations, then you should be able to tell that the entire thing is a face, even if you can't see all the parts. I kind of got at this idea when um, I showed the pictures of the cornflake box that is against a background with other cereal boxes in it. And I said, look, we cannot see the entire box of cornflakes. There's a part of it that's covered up. But come on. You can tell from the rest of the appearance of it that that is, in fact, the cornflake box. So we want any algorithm that we come up with to detect objects based on their parts to work pretty well if there are fewer parts present in the image. So in other words, if there are k parts, let's say we have five parts, which are the left eye, the right eye, the nose, the mouth. Well, skip the mouth. Say you have the left ear and the right ear. That's five parts. And if you only see four of them, you should still be able to identify that the face is sitting there in the image. So this is the big idea. Seems pretty simple. When, in fact, the implementation of these, this very simple idea is, uh, can be incredibly complex, in fact. And we'll see why that is. So here's the part where we take our intuitive idea for what we want to do and squish it into mathematics. And in this case, it's going to be a fairly statistical brand of mathematics in which we consider a probabilistic distribution. So for those of you who haven't taken a... Ah, let me take a poll. How, I, I have taken a statistics course. That is awesome. <laughs> Sorry, you're the only one. That's too bad. So for this guy, I will <laughs> explain. No, it's, it's really quite simple. Uh, a probability Excuse distribution me. is basically a function with a domain and a range. And the domain is some set of variables of interest. And the range is from 0 to 1. So this function takes a couple of arguments. And in our case, the arguments are going to be an identifier of an object of interest. So this is just going to, the object is going to identify the class of objects like face, building, car. And the other argument is going to be an image. And the idea is that. If I evaluate this function with that particular class of objects and that particular photograph, then I'm going to get a number out that's between 0 and 1, where 0 means that it is really not likely that that object is present in the image, and 1 means that it really is likely that that object is present in the image. So that's the very general construct here, is that we have a probability distribution uh, that is over objects and images. And it happens to be called a conditional distribution, which is to say the notion is that we want to see what the probability of the object is given that we have this image. That's kind of not such an important detail, but in statistics it's referred to as a, the probability that the object is there conditioned on a particular image. Uh, and furthermore, what we're going to do is we're going to modularize. It's one of the things that we really that helps us more than anything in computer science is the ability to modularize big, complicated tasks into a set of simpler tasks, which we then uh, solve individually. So what we're going to do here is break down this very uh, general function into two sub functions, and then think about each one of those individually. So the first one of these is going to be okay. We're going to represent this probability of the object being present, given the imaging data, as the product of two sub-functions. The first one is going to tell us the probability that each one of our k parts of our object, again, left eye, right eye, nose, left ear, right ear, mouth. Let's make it six, because everybody's got a mouth. Uh, it's going to tell us the probabilities that each of these parts are in the image at specific locations. So this, again, it's a probability distribution. So it's a mapping between some input domain and the range from 0 to 1. And in particular, you can imagine having a left eye function that says, that gives you the probability that the left eye, part number 1, say, is present at a particular location in the image. And you can represent the location in the image in terms of a rectangle of pixels 
or just the center of a rectangle of pixels with an understanding about how large that region is. Okay, well, I'm going to leave that vague. But let's say that the center of the region that, that we are considering here is x, comma, y, xk, comma, yk. So it's going to give us a number for the probability that that part is located at this location in the image. Again, it's conditional. It's given the imaging data. Okay. So that's the first of our two sub-functions that we're going to use to address this problem of whether the object's in the image or not. The second one is going to be the probability that a set of parts are in a plausible arrangement. So this is taking that intuitive notion that you don't have a random scramble of eyes, noses, eyes, nose, and mouth in a random kind of configuration scrambled around and still have a valid face that really the eyes have to appear in a particular location with respect to the nose and the mouth for you to actually think that it is a face. So the second one is going to tell us what is the probability that the object is in the image given that I take it as a fact that part one is at a particular location and that part two is present at a particular location and that part three is located at a particular location. So what this is going to do is you're going to give it a putative or a hypothetical set of locations of your parts. So you're going to say, let's just say, for the sake of argument, that I have identified an eye at this location in the image, a left eye at that location in the image, a nose here, a right eye here, and so on. Does it look like a plausible arrangement of those parts for me to consider it a face? Or does it look like a random scramble with eye, <coughs> ear, other eye and mouth all in a line, for example. So one of the things that's nice about thinking of this problem in these two modular components is that the first one can be solved or evaluated or engineered using the stuff that we talked about last time. So really what we're talking about is representing the space of possible image patches for left eyes and the space of possible image patches for right eyes and the space of possible image patches for mouths. So here what you're doing is you're basically taking your problem of representing an entire object in terms of patches of pixels and turning that into a problem where bits of your object are represented by patches of pixels. So I'd argue that this first function, or this first uh, sub-probability distribution can be solved by using things like principal components analysis by filter banks, Gabor filters, and so on, and those kinds of methods, together with a classifier that tells you whether a patch looks, looks like left eye or doesn't. The second one is this, what I would call a part arrangement model. It's the thing, again, that gives you a zero to one score as to whether an arrangement of these parts looks plausible or doesn't. And that's what I'm actually going to spend the bulk of the rest of the time talking about is the second thing under an assumption that you already kind of have a pretty good idea of how to solve the first thing. Any questions about this at this point? OK, good. So now, as I've said, you all in this room with no time taken whatsoever and no uncertainty on your part can tell that that is a photograph of a guy. You can't see the mouth. The mouth is one of the identifying features of a person. That didn't slow you down hardly at all. And the reason why you can do that is because the presence of three out of our well, here what they do is they, they represent the left corner and the right corner of the mouth in terms of two different parts. but And that's what these two X's are. But even though you can only see the two eyes and the nose, you can tell that the face is there. So what you do if some of the parts are missing and you take this uh, idea of starting with probability of the object being there given the image and breaking it down into the probability of each of the parts and the probability that they're in a plausible arrangement, what you can do is consider all possible locations of the left corner of the mouth. Just can think about all possible positions. And consider all possible positions for the right one, too. And then what you do is you average over all of those possible left corners of the mouth and all of those possible right corners of the mouth. 
This is called marginalizing. It's taking a uh, statistical model that has one, two, three, four, five parameters and giving you a probability over just the first three parameters by considering the space of all possible fourth ones and fifth ones. So essentially this is averaging or integrating over all possible positions and it's statistically, in, st in the statistics world, this is very well defined, it's done all the time, and it's very, very straightforward. So this is how it kind of automatically falls out of your what you've done, that you can detect a face that has only four of its five parts there, even though you can only see four of them. Okay? So, uh, let's say that we um, that we decide to do this, that we decide to consider these two sub-functions in our formulation, then we have two steps that we need to follow. The first is a training step, aka parameter estimation. So, um, and in parameter estimation, we need to decide on a couple of different things. First of all, um, uh, I've just been very vague about the part arrangement model. I haven't actually given you a functional form for it. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about what possible functional forms for this function are. But you have to decide on what that part arrangement model is going to be. And that function is going to have some set of parameters associated with it that are going to be uh, one set of values for birds and another set of values for faces and another set of values for buildings. So then what you do, once you have a parametric form for this part arrangement model, you can then estimate the parameters using training data. So this would be sets of images on which someone has gone to the uh, trouble of identifying what parts of the image have faces in them. And not only that, but where the left eye is, where the right eye is, where the nose is, where the left corner of the mouth is, where the right corner of the mouth is. Or similarly, for motorcycles, maybe you label where the two wheels are, where the engine is, where the handlebars are, and so on. So that, basically what that will give you is a set of parameters for your part arrangement model that do a pretty good job of saying that parts of the training images that have motorcycles in them actually have a high probability of having motorcycles in them. And that parts of the training images that don't have motorcycles in them have a low probability of having motorcycles in them. This is usually called maximum likelihood or maximum a posteriori estimation, where you basically have a function that is trying to replicate what is in the training data. In other words, that zero to one valued function, you want it to be close to one wherever a motorcycle has been identified and close to zero everywhere else. So that's parameter estimation, aka training. The other step of the process is when I am given a brand new image and I'm forced to look at it and identify where all the cars are, I do what's called inference, which is to say uh, if I have k different parts, I find a set of coordinates for them, x1, y1, x2, y2, you know, x and y location of the left eye, x and y location of the right eye, and so on, such that two things are true. First of all, the, uh, the part model that tells us the appearance of the left eye and the right eye and so on, the value of that thing should be high for each one of the parts, and the part arrangement model should give us a high probability too, simply stated, each of the parts should look like the part that it's supposed to look at, look like in the image, and all of them should be in the right arrangement. Is that clear? Okay, goody. Now, let's talk about these part arrangement models, which is kind of the new thing that's been thrown into the mix here. Different ones place more or fewer constraints on how these parts ought to be situated. And we'll give some examples for that. If, and generally speaking, if the part arrangement model places fewer constraints on how parts can be arranged with respect to each other, then these things are generally easier to train, easier to implement, faster to evaluate in practice on a novel image. So they're often quick and dirty. The ones that are, have more constraints that, that provide more information about how plausible a particular arrangement of parts is, these are generally more accurate or more realistic in the real world. So what you can do actually, given a particular part arrangement model, is come up with kind of um, uh, arrangements of parts provided by an adversary 
and try to break it. And it, this, is, this is a fairly easy thing to do. You can say, well, okay, now let's say that I end up having my two eyes and the nose is below it in the right arrangement, but the mouth is above the eyes. Then if I do the math, I can show that that actually appears to be a very plausible arrangement of parts, even though eh, it's not so much. So the idea is that if you want to exclude uh, breaking cases like that, you want to have a model that has more constraints in it. And the one that you should use kind of depends a lot on the object that you're looking at, how they appear in the images, and engineering decisions. Does it have to be fast? Does it have to be extremely accurate? And what's the trade-off there? So let's look at the most baseline, simple part arrangement model that is not really a part arrangement model at all. I just include it to consider what you would do if you didn't really actually care about how they are arranged spatially. It's called voting. In other words, all you simply do is you, uh, for a given set of positions x1, x, x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on, you simply evaluate the probability that the one for the left eye looks like the left eye, and you evaluate the probability that the one for the right eye looks like the right eye, and so on and so forth, and you simply multiply these things together. So it doesn't care if they are in the right arrangement or not. It just cares about the degree to which the left eye looks like the left eye and the right eye looks like the right eye and so on. And usually what will happen is that um, each one of these parts will lend kind of a vote. You can think about this product as being a voting kind of procedure where if there is one part that really, really does not look like the nose, for example, it's going to cast a very low vote for this actually being a face. But if all of the parts look like their part to a great degree, then they're all going to cast a high vote for the face being there. But you can imagine something that's more complicated than that where, um, what's a good example? What is a good example? Imagine that uh, noses are difficult to, uh, to uh, detect in faces because it's basically skin against skin and the, the nose kind of blends into the face in your images, let's just say. Meanwhile, the eyes and the mouth are more distinctive, especially the eyes because there is a, the, every eye has a black part in the middle surrounded by a colored thing, surrounded by a white thing that is rep relatively high contrast. In that case, what you might want to do is have your eye detections cast a more weighty vote. So in other words, even if it doesn't look like that much like a nose, it could be because the appearance of a nose is ambiguous. So uh, you call that weighted voting. But in the most basic case, the, uh, each part casts an equal weight vote for the object. So the left eye casts one vote, the right eye casts another vote, and so on. So the problem with this is that each of those individual little parts on their own are not very discriminating. So what these people did, Schmidt and Moore, is they, um, they did exactly this. They had a database with 100 objects in it. And they broke each one of them up into little parts. And they took a new image of one of these objects. It turns out it was the one in this first category here. And they had the new image of that object, which I, get, I think this is something like a, it was like a tea kettle or something. And they said, OK, each of my individual little tea kettle parts cast votes for which object you think you are, just based on your own local little imaging data. And what this histogram shows you is the number of votes that each class of objects got given the little patches of imaging data from the tea kettle image. So the first one is the number of votes that tea kettle got. The second one might be the number of votes that airplane got. This one might be the number of votes that bottle of aspirin got, and so on. What you should see is that, yeah, technically speaking, uh, Tea kettle got the most votes, but not by a whole lot. And in fact, this very unambiguous tea kettle image actually has a fairly high chance of being called something else, airplane or uh, motorcycle. So the individual little parts by themselves are not that discriminating. And if you were to... Uh, you know, use ITK or some other image processing software to hunt through images for, part, for individual little 
image patches that cover entirely different objects but look the same when you look at them in isolation, you would be successful without much effort. So here's two individual image patches which, if you just look at them in isolation, they look more or less similar to each other. They actually look fairly the same. But one of them covers grass and the other one covers the boundary between the roof line there and the sky. So, um, and well, one problem there is that the size of the rectangles is not quite right. So actually the red rectangle at the top is not placed in the right position, but you get the idea. Um, and so this, this is why that voting doesn't really work that well, is because just looking at individual patches in isolation, it doesn't really tell you that much about uh, whether the part is a part of the leaf pile or a part of the roof. So the next most complicated thing you can do outside of voting is to use what are called angle constraints. And simply put, if you have six parts of your object, what you're going to what you're going to do is set up basically a coordinate system where one of them is the origin, and two of the other ones have uh, have lines that go out towards them, and then you represent the angle between that is made by this triple of points. And what you're going to do is very simply say, look. Uh, the probability that those three parts are in a plausible arrangement with respect to each other is proportional to some function of this angle. And you can imagine why this might make sense for uh, the two eyes and the nose, for example. So it's not the case that, well, for one thing, I think you can say that the angle made by my two eyes with the nose being the origin should be, should be acute. At the very least, if it was obtuse, that would be basically saying that the eyes are down here while the nose is up there. And it should definitely not be near 180 degrees because that's saying that the nose and the eyes are basically in a straight line. So that's one example. That's the next most complicated thing you can do is say, if the angles that are made by triples of parts are not plausible, then the arrangement of parts is not plausible. And note, too, that the, um, these angles are invariant to rotation of the entire object. So again, if you go back to my example of, of taking a photograph of the entire human face, and then this entire human face, the angle made by the two eyes and the nose are the same. It doesn't change. They're also invariant to scaling, by the way, which means that if you move closer to the camera, that angle doesn't change either. And it's surprising that adding this little extra constraint on top of voting actually makes your set of parts of the tea kettle uh, look very, very different from every other object in your database of 100 objects. So here's what happens when your part arrangement model is simply voting. Again, we're seeing, does the photograph of the tea kettle cast a lot of votes for airplane and jet ski and motorcycle and so on? And when we add these angle constraints, the number of votes for, or you get the probability of being um, tea kettle goes way up and the probability of being everything else goes way down. So this is a big help for this particular set of data. However, I'll bet that you can imagine, if you think about it, a set of objects for which there are plausible part configurations and they vary over a, they vary, V-A-R-Y, over a very wide range of angles. So for example, I have a plausible, this is a plausible configuration of my arm, and so is that, and its angle with respect to my shoulder just flipped by 180 degrees. So that's a wide range of angles. In other words, there isn't really any plausible set of, there isn't really any implausible set of angles for my arm to be with respect to my torso. And an elbow joint is another example. The human body is full of those examples. Now, um, imagine that you want to then consider possibilities for cases when uh, these angle constraints are just not constraining enough for things like the human body. Then what you can do is use what's called a Markov random field. So Markov random fields, they were developed in the first place to model the behavior of systems of subatomic particles in statistical physics. They were then following the usual 
program. They were then picked up by image processing people and hijacked and applied to imaging problems. And the reason why we all as a community did that is because the physicists figure out, figured out um, a very nice computational model in which all you really need to specify are two different functions, which is to say your uh, part appearance function, what does this part of the image look like part K, and a compatibility function that is defined between neighbors. So for example, if I have two parts that are near each other, J and K, what is the probability that part K is right here given that part J is its neighbor, that is close to it? And it turns out that if you only specify these two relatively local properties, in other words, neither of those tell you about the entire object per se, if you only specify those two things and follow a particular computational regimen, you can actually say things about how probable the entire arrangement of parts is together by using some tricks that essentially integrates this information that is local across the entire set of parts. So I'm not really going to go into the details about how Markov random fields work or why, but you can take that as kind of the, the take home message, which is that there is a computational machinery called a Markov random field solver that takes the image and takes this obser so-called observation function and this so-called compatibility function, which is sort of a local version of our part arrangement model. And it, it does inference on those and gives you a set of part labels for each one of these parts that maximizes the whole probability of the object being in the image altogether in sum. So that's Markov Random Fields, and there's a great book about it by Stan Lee. Not that Stan Lee, the cartoonist, the other one. Here's an example of Markov Random Fields in practice. So the first thing that was done on this uh, kind of contrived photograph of a um, telephone hovering in midair was that we did sparse matching. Recall that what that means is that you identify isolated locations in the image that appear interesting in some general sense, and those are represented by, each one of those is represented by a box. So what we would usually do if we wanted to identify an entire object that filled up just one of these boxes, we would, we would evaluate whether this box looked like the object, this box looked like the object, this box looked like the object, and so on. And we talked about that in the lecture on saliency, AKA interesting points. Here we're gonna do something different, which is that we're going to link up each of these boxes to neighboring boxes over some radius. And then these are going to be our set of neighbors for evaluating the compatibility function. So for each one of these boxes, we're gonna say, does that box look like the lower left-hand portion of the keypad of the telephone? Does it look like the receiver, uh, the mouth part of the receiver? Does it look like the ear part of the receiver? Does it look like the cord, and so on? We're gonna evaluate that for each one of our parts, and let's say that those are our parts. And the connections between the neighbors are, going to, are what we're gonna to use to evaluate this so-called compatibility function which is to say, what is the probability that the receiver's mouth end is right here, given that the lower left-hand corner of the keypad is right here? And so on for all possible combinations of the different parts. Yeah? Um, so if we're scanning an image like this for multiple yeah. uh, like sets of uh, stock images, uh, how would we arrange the data? Well, I'm sorry. Can you use the mic and repeat that? I, I always forget. Oh. So if we're searching this image for a whole bunch of uh, stock images that we have, so like a database, how would we go about searching the database? Just linearly or? You mean in training or at, at you, or you mean we have already done training and it's at runtime? Yeah. Yeah, so there's, uh, you can use either one of those two strategies. You can either the time-consuming way to do it is to take each one of your parts individually, scan the entire image for left eyes, and then you, that would give you a set of locations. Scan the entire image for noses. That would give you another set of locations. Scan the entire image for mouths. 
and so on. That's one way to do it. Or the other way to do it is to take a general procedure for identifying so-called interesting or salient locations in the image, and that's what they did here, which you hope that your entire set of eyes, noses, and mouths, or in this case, different parts of the keypad and so on, are captured by at least one of those interesting regions and that you haven't missed any. So it's much faster, but it has those pitfalls. Okay. So then, this uh, is a busy little plot here, but it gives a representation of all those links that I talked about, where you link up each part location with its neighbors in the image. So then, as I've said, all you have to do at that point is evaluate the observation function, which is to say, what's the probability that this patch looks like the lower left-hand portion of the keypad? What's the probability that it looks like the cord? What's the probability that it looks like the mouth part of the receiver, and so on and so on. You do that for all of those boxes, and you evaluate so the so-called compatibility function, which is what's the probability that this guy is the mouth part of the receiver given that this guy is the ear part of the receiver. You take all that information, you pass it to a Markov random field solver, which I will not describe, but there's a whole body of literature on how to do that, and public domain software for doing it, and what you end up with is a label for each one of these boxes that gives you the most probable label for that box. And by the way, probably the most important label in your set of possible labels is none of the above. So what, you're, what we're showing here are the set of boxes that did not get labeled none of the above. So if you got a label of none of the above, you, just, you don't get represented here. But these white blocks represent parts that got labeled something other. So they got labeled as being part of the telephone. And what you can see is that it does a fair job. I'm not sure what's going on over here. That is whoops. But um, as you can see, all the parts that are on or around the phone, all the parts that are called something on or around the phone are on or around the phone. So Markov random fields. Another thing you can do is what's called a part arrangement model. Uh, of the type of constellation models. So you all know what a constellation is up in the sky. Uh, it's basically a set of dots, from your point of view, it's a set of dots that uh, all together uh, co-vary in some way, depending on what time of night it is, the rotation of the Earth, and what time of year it is. So a constellation model, what you do is you think, OK, I'm going to take my three parts, let's say, uh, left hand, left hand, right hand, and torso. And I'm going to say, all right, what I'm going to do is take over all my training images, the XY position of this one, the XY position of that one, and the XY position of that one, and I'm going to, f I'm going to stack those all together in one of our long vectors of numbers that we talk about. So this is like in the pack, in the uh, previous lecture where we took our image patches and arranged the intensities in terms of a long vector. I'm just going to arrange these as a long vector and say that that vector is drawn from a high dimensional Gaussian distribution with some mean and some covariance. And furthermore, I'm going to say that, uh, you know, basically that um, I'm going to make this idea invariant to translation and rotation and scaling, which is to say you're as probable of being those three parts of the body, whether you are rotated or whether you're on the left side of the image versus the right side, or whether you're closer to the camera or further away from the camera. And I'm going to do that by setting up some standardized coordinate system, for example, where the torso is at the origin and the, let's say, the left hand is, along, is oriented with the y-axis. And there's a great book by Dryden and Mardia, which is a classic, which talks about this kind of model, which, again, we, we, we stole this again. So this is actually developed for um, uh, um, uh, paleontology. So uh, looking at the positions of landmarks on skulls of animals over the course of evolution and whether those things statistically uh, vary in interesting ways with respect to genetics and so on. But then again, it was taken and applied to image processing. 
And if you do that for these three-part models of the human face, you can again go back to this very interesting idea of uh, marginalizing, which is to say, if I only know the positions of the left and the right eye, and I assume that I know them with perfect certainty, what are the possible positions of the nose? And in fact, in this case, what they did is they have five parts, the two middles of the eyes, the left nostril, right nostril, and middle of the nose. And what you can see is that if the only thing you know is the positions of the eyes, the positions that are plausible for the two nostrils and the middle of the nose are actually fairly well constrained. You could imagine seeing a face in a photograph where the two eyes are there and the nostril, the left, or the right nostril is way over here and the right, right nostril is way over here. Boxers, for example, the noses are all flat and widened out, you know? Uh, similarly, if you only know the positions of the two nostrils, you can imagine taking a photograph where the two eyes are way up here or way down here. I'm not sure about uh, why the middle of the nose would be way down here if you knew that the two nostrils were right there, but anyway, you get the general idea. So you can do this to kind of step through the image. You can imagine first detecting where the eyes are and then constraining your search for where the nose is based on where the eyes are that you found. So this is where this constellation model is a useful thing. And furthermore, you can show that if you model the joint, this is called the joint appearances or the joint positions of the set of all parts together in this long vector. If you model that whole thing together, you actually get more robust performance in terms of identifying where the face is compared to if you just identify where the parts are individually. So it easily gets confused because, again, it's not integrating imaging information over multiple parts. It's just looking at each one of those parts individually. OK. Here's another example of constellation models that are a little bit more complicated. And uh, furthermore, this is even more exotic because it essentially took a set of images from training data that was unlabeled. Yes, we knew that there were motorcycles in the input images, but nobody took the painful trouble of identifying where the back wheel was and where the front wheel was and where the handlebar was and where the blah, blah, blah was. It automatically determined a part configuration model uh, based on the idea that parts should look similarly across all the training images and that there should be a more or less constrained set of uh, relative spatial arrangements of those parts. So it automatically figured out some pretty uh, intuitive things, which is first of all that there is a part called the front wheel that looks very similar across all images. There is a kind of a handlebar gas tank part thing that it varies across images, and sometimes it even gets wrong which one is the, what part is the handlebars. Uh, and also in the back, there is often a wheel that's got a tailpipe in front of it. Again, not too, not too unintuitive. And it figured all this stuff out automatically from training data. Sorry about that. Um, now, let's see. So motorcycles are not necessarily arranged hierarchically. And what I mean is that uh, it's not the case that the wheel or the engine or the handlebars have any kind of central hub role where all of the other parts emanate out from that hub. The human body and the body of many mammals is different than that in the sense that we have a trunk or that we have a torso and that our limbs emanate out from our torsos. So you can take advantage of this fact by building what are called hierarchical part arrangement models where uh, basically there are a set of component parts called leg and body and neck. And the body plays a central role in the sense that bodies are always seen, well, are usually seen together with legs to form body-leg uh, configurations. Bodies are also seen together with necks to make 
kind of trunks with a neck on top of it. And then sometimes you get all three of them together in the same place, which is to say you have legs, bodies, and a neck all together. And in fact, sometimes you have two legs. So you can use this to build up a hierarchical representation of the body based on the focus being on the trunk, which is kind of the central thing that the other parts of the body emanate out from. Here's another example of the same idea. You should, uh, it should be clear right away that the torso plays a central role because in this kind of graphical model, you see that there's the torso in the middle and that the left upper arm, LUA, and the right upper arm and the right upper leg and so on all emanate out from that. So you can build a similar kind of statistical model to the Markov random field models. However, this kind of thing is much faster because it has a constrained structure to it. In particular, if you know the position of the torso and the right lower leg, then that's all you need to know to determine the probability that the right upper leg is somewhere. You don't need to know anymore the left upper arm, the left lower arm, the right upper arm, and so on, because basically the torso and the right lower leg tell you everything that you could possibly need to know about the right upper leg. But that's by construction. I am telling you, or I am telling the model, I'm placing a bet, basically, that everything I could ever want to know about the right upper leg is already contained in the amount of information provided by the torso and the right lower leg. So this makes inference very, very fast because if you are given a set of part configurations, uh, you now have, you can use a smarter procedure for determining what the best labels are for those parts because it has this constrained structure. And if you've ever heard of hidden Markov mar models or Markov chains, that's often the term that is used to refer to this kind of structure. And it's always applied to people. So here's your canonical model with a torso and a left upper leg and so on, and you can use those to detect that object in different uh, positions and orientations of the image relatively quickly. Now, we come to um, the kind of difficult practicality with part models, which is that they take a long time to run in practice. So let's say we do our training, we estimate the parameters of our statistical models that describe part appearance and part arrangement. So given a novel image, how do we go about actually computing where the parts are in the image and that overall probability that the object is there given the imaging data? Well, the best thing, the right thing to do, if you really wanted to be sure that you had the right answer, is to consider all possible locations for each part. So if you can think of the coordinates of each of the pixels, you think of the left eye at being at 1, 1, the left eye at being at 1, 2, the left eye at being 1, 3, and at the same time, all other parts being at all other positions with respect to that. So all possible positions of all possible parts are considered, and if for each one of those configurations, you evaluate both whether the parts look right individually and whether the configuration of them looks right. However, the number of possible combinations of part positions is gigantic. It's basically the size of your image to the power of number of parts. It's basically uh, number of pixels choose number of parts if, you, if you've taken discrete math. And that's a huge amount. So we need to do something more approximate to save time. One thing to do is a bottom-up approach where the first thing you do is individually identify where the parts are. And something like that could have been done in the Markov random field case where we first scan the image to look for not just generally interesting parts, but we scan the image to look for mouth parts of the receiver, we scan the image to look for uh, keypads and that kind of thing. And then post hoc, we consider combining those parts in various ways. So then, that is still potentially problematic because if you detect X number of left eyes and Y number of right eyes and Z number of mouths, you have potentially x times y times z possible configurations to check afterwards. So sometimes you can be smart by uh, pruning this search in some smart way. The other thing to do is the opposite, which is called top-down, where you take a prototypical configuration of your object and you either scan the image with it in some sense or you plop it down and kind of wiggle it around. 
So for humans, you can imagine taking one of those prototypical upper arm, lower arm, torso, upper leg, lower leg things, and plopping it down onto some locations in the image that seem kind of plausible, like they maybe might have a human body there. And then moving the arms and legs around so that they appear like they're in the right position. And where to try these initial positions is, again, is kind of difficult and, and ill-defined. So the right part arrangement model depends on the object. Um, and these are some things for you to consider. Uh, yeah, you can read that since I'm out of time. But just to summarize, part space detection takes advantage of the fact that there are a lot of objects that consist of well-defined parts in terms of well-defined in terms of their appearance that appear in conspicuous spatial arrangements. So to solve that problem, you need a model for how each part looks and how they are arranged spatially. And there are ways to do this spatial arrangements of parts modeling. And if some of the parts are missing, you can be smart about detecting the object in spite of that. Any last minute questions? OK, great. See you next week. And I guess uh, discussion is next.